21. And we are still, um, we, I think we all thought we'd be more in the recovery stage. I think we have to say we're still in the pandemic inching hopefully closer to the recovery stage. We know there are still a lot of significant issues and barriers that are impacting students with disabilities throughout the state. We're obviously, you know, schools are fully open. That doesn't mean that all students with disabilities are able to attend school if they have exacerbating health issues. And we know there are, we decided, um, you know, I'm joined tonight by Liza Hirsch, an attorney who you've heard from before, all of us you've heard from before. William Malixi is our communications manager and Joanne Pino, one of our advocates. But what we're gathering from our helpline and from uh, what we're hearing from our sister organizations is that there are still a lot of questions that many of you have, um, whether it's about home hospital services or uh, how to address the increased behavioral health and mental health needs of kids as they're entering schools problems with the test and stay, what happens under quarantine. I, I think we're going to hear a range of questions and we just thought it made most sense to give you time to ask more of the questions that we don't have time to do in our regular chats. Liza, do you want to add anything before um, Lily might have a few more housekeeping things for us? I don't think so. Yeah, just looking forward to hearing your questions and, um, you know, want to be as helpful as we can. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome back to all of our regulars. Um, so just a few housekeeping things. We're excited to offer live transcription and captioning. You can click the live transcription button on your Zoom menu to turn that feature on or off um, and to download the transcription. So like Julia said, tonight's chat will be a full Q&A. Um, so you can submit your question at any point during the presentation. Please try to keep your questions brief to allow us to get to as many people as we can. Um, to submit a question, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can click the Q&A button on the menu of your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can submit your question as a comment under the live stream. Um, and please keep an eye on the chat box in Zoom and on the comment section in Facebook, because um, we'll be sharing resources there throughout tonight's chat. If you see someone else's question that, that you'd like us to answer, please give it a like. Um, you can do that on Zoom and on Facebook. The chat feature will be turned off for participants on Zoom, but you can, um, like I said, keep an eye there. That's where I'll be um, sharing resources. So with that, it looks like we've got a few hellos. Thank you, Salima, for joining us. That's one of our regulars. <laughs> um, and go ahead and submit your questions. Oh, we've got a we've got a poll going. If you can respond to that, it should have opened up. So we assume that everybody is. Um, things are very different in different school districts. Um, you know, we know there's been big transportation issues in some school districts. The National Guard is helping out in some school districts. The National Guard is now gonna be helping with the test and stay program. But uh, we're eager to hear um, you know, what you're facing with your own kids or the kids that you're working with that you'd like to ask about. Yeah, and any questions related to home hospital services, compensatory services we know is a major issue that many families have been coping with. Um, last time I talked a lot about mental health and social and emotional supports for students. So we're happy to answer any questions along those lines or just, you know, how to meet your child's needs during this time as they transition back to school in person or yeah. if they continue or if they need to be at home or in the hospital. Um, so it looks like we have our first question and also some new folks here tonight. So welcome if this is your first time. Um, once you register for one chat, you're registered for the full series. So you'll get reminders, but our chats are the second Thursday of each month at 8 p.m. So mark your calendar for that. Um, our first question is, if a child was hospitalized for more than 60 days, does he get compensatory tutoring that is not in his IEP? Um, that's a good question. The way the home hospital um, reg regulations are stated, a student doesn't have to have already 
been in the home or hospital in 60 days. There needs to be a, a, a form filled out by the child's physician stating that it's anticipated that the child will need to be at home or in the hospital for 60 days. And before the pandemic, this was really used um, for students who were had to be hospitalized for reasons other than COVID or had to be home for home, you know, uh, mental health or physical health reasons not related to COVID. And now it's being used because of COVID. And I don't know if the question in this example was because of COVID or not. Um, and then what's, the IEP team is supposed to meet whenever the school district gets the form filled out by the doctor saying that the, it's anticipated the child will be at home or in the hospital for 60 days or more. And then the team <coughs> can decide if they, the IEP still needs to be fully implemented. The IEP team for that child, like for any other child, needs to consider whether there's any additional needs of the child may be resulting from the pandemic or resulting from other issues that may require additional services. So that would be the case, whether this was a child out for 60 days for COVID or for other, or for other reasons. Um, and it's very clear that live streaming is one option of how to provide home hospital services in the past had been more traditional tutoring. And in the past, and many of the families that we worked with before COVID, the home hospital services didn't meet the legal standard. They were often very minimal services, like five hours a week, or and they weren't fully implementing the IEP. But it is clear from the language of the regs and what's been clear from all the guidance that IEP still need to be fully implemented in addition to any new needs, if I was understanding that question correctly, that may arise. Eliza, do you wanna add anything to that? Um, no, just that if if the child was for any period of time not receiving services or if the child couldn't access services um, delivered by the school district and, you know, as a result, the child couldn't make progress, then the child may be owed compensatory services. It really depends on the situation. Um, so if it's anticipated that the child is going to be out for 60 or more days, there's this, there's this form, as Julia stated, that needs to be completed. But if there was some prior period of time in which the school district was not meeting their obligation to deliver services on the student's IEP, there may be um, an obligation of the district to provide compensatory services. Those are good points. And if whoever asked a question, if we're not quite getting it, you know, feel free to clarify if this part of what we didn't understand. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I just put those forms, links to the forms in the chat as well. And we have a and a also, which I'll put in in a second. Um, the questions are starting to roll in now. Keep those coming. Um, our next question is, oh, there's a follow up on that. These would be hours of missed in general ed, not services in the IEP. It's another really good question because um, the 60 day requirement is the requirement for kids with disabilities, but all children um, who may need to be, who are gonna be in a home or hospital for 14 days or more, have the right to um, access to their general ed curriculum and services. There's not really a right to compensatory services in the general ed law but um, they have to provide access to general ed services for kids with disabilities. So they're supposed to be getting the gen ed service. They're, they're supposed to be getting the services they need in the home or hospital that will enable them to continue to progress in the gen ed curriculum. But I don't know of a right to compensatory services for gen, gen ed services, but there may be a link to the disability that might make it um, arguably part of the special ed. It's hard to know without knowing more of the facts. But that's just the thoughts that came to my mind, Liza. You may have additional thoughts. Yeah, right. There, there isn't a right to compensatory services for for general ed, um, but it yeah, it really depends on the situation because if the student has a disability in an IEP and was was receiving special ed services in a general ed setting, then arguably the student could be owed compensatory services. And then the other piece that comes to mind for me is that there is a guidance from Desi about. Um, general ed, I forget the term that's used, but basically recovery, you know, services and 
um, helping gen ed students kind of get back up to speed. Um, and, and all students should be receiving those services, but, but they're not, um, they're different from compensatory services. Um, just things like if students need to access counselors and um, or, ha or having other challenges, there are some gen ed um, kind of efforts being made to help students get caught up. I, I can look up what, I'll look up that what those are called. Um, someone's asking, wouldn't COVID compensatory services apply to general ed? I think I might have answered that already. Do COVID compensatory services apply to general ed? They they apply to implementing the IEP. So that's what I think the point that Liza was making is um, to the extent that there's supports in the gen ed setting, then arguably, you know, you might be able to make, make the link, but it's 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 for implementing the IEP. It's for IEPs that weren't fully implemented and the child therefore not making sufficient progress. These are really good questions. Yeah. Um, okay, next question is, can compensatory services be provided as tutoring services? Can they be provided as a one-on-one -on -one support versus a small group? What formats and options are available for students? Um, another really good question. That's all of those things are completely appropriate for the IP team to determine. The, it's the IP team that is, um, the state has said should be convening to determine if a child needs compensatory services. And if so, what are the compensatory services that are most likely gonna make the child whole? So any of the options that that person um, was questioning about are completely appropriate for the parent to ask for the team to consider and to discuss You know, if that's what's necessary. And like anything else in special ed, if the team can't agree about what, what the type of compensatory services are, then the family can pursue that through mediation or through filing a complaint or through going through the hearing process. But hopefully when the team meets, they'll be able to um, uh, determine what's gonna be appropriate for that individual child. And I wanna underscore about the individual child because we have heard that there are, first of all, um, we are still hearing from families who have not yet had an IP meeting to discuss whether or not their child needs compensatory services. And we've also heard of instances where the compensatory services that are being offered are really not individualized. You know, the school district is offering the same thing for every child, regardless of the extent of their IP not being implemented or what the impact is on that particular child. So it absolutely is clearly legally supposed to be individualized to meet your own child's needs. Liza, jump in there. Any thoughts? Um, yeah, I actually don't have anything to add on that one, but I wanted to mention that I did find the name of um, the other supports we were talking about. It's called General Education Recovery Support, which is supposed to be just supports provided to all students, students with disabilities, students without disabilities, it's, not, it's different from compensatory services, which is determined by the IEP team, but it states general education support that all students, including students with disabilities, may need to recover from educational gaps in learning or loss of skill, or even the impact on students' emotional well-being caused by the unexpected suspension of in-person education. And that's something that all schools are supposed to be delivering to all students. So it's just something to keep in mind relative to the previous question about um, general education support and services. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in now and I, I apologize, I didn't have the liking turned on. So I just turned that on. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can go in to the Q&A box and like any questions that you also have or um, that you would like us to answer that moves them to the top of the list. Uh, our next question is, do the Massachusetts dyslexia guidelines apply to dyscalculia? If not, what should parents do to get a research-based program into the IEP of their struggling child for dyscalculia? Um, I do not know the answer to that um, without going back to look at the dyslexia, you know, what was required by the dyslexia law that got passed that led to the very extensive guidelines that the state has issued. So I think we'd have to probably send some, in, unless other people who are listening know the answer to that question, we'll have to get back to you about that. But in terms of how to get the research-based um, intervention that your child requires, 
it's still, there's no one size fits all, even with the dyslexia um, law and guidelines that are there. It still has to be an, I, there's certain things that the districts need to be doing in terms of screening kids and having the research-based um, interventions available, but it has to be an IEP team determination in terms of the right assessment done by the district, the team determining the, the evaluation, you have the right to get some outs an outside evaluation, but it all, it all circles back to the IEP team process. Does, I don't know if, if, if other yeah. people can add in the chat, if they know, have any more details, Liza, unless you do to the answers to that question. I don't know the specific answer to the question about dyscalculia, um, but I, I would just reiterate what you said, Julia, which is um, that an independent evaluation, if the school district has already conducted an evaluation and you were not satisfied with it, um, an independent about evaluation, I think would be the most effective way to introduce you know, evidence-based practice that's going to be individualized for your child and, and um, make recommendations for what your child needs. And that's gonna be, I think, the most effective basis for, for advocacy for what your child needs. And trying to find an expert who really has um, specific specialization and expertise in dyscalculia would be, would be important. But we will, unless, uh, Lilia, what's the best way if there are people here, we've, I'm sure we have a lot of knowledgeable participants, if they have some knowledge, should they put it in the chat or in the Q&A if they have more information to share? Um, you can put it in the Q&A either as a question or you can comment under this person's question. Um, and if you're joining us on Facebook, you can also chime in in the comment section on Facebook. Right. And we will do um, some, you know, we'll look into this and when Lilia sends the resources afterwards, we'll provide what we find out. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is, using the DESI COVID-19 decision tree, would there be a situation in which a student that was exposed at school within six feet and not on the bus and not masked, so it's a no-no on the exposure tree, um, the decision tree states test and stay, but the school says no test and stay because the student with disabilities does not have 100% perfect mask wearing student has physical and intellectual disabilities and has to quarantine at home. Um, in the decision tree, the last question reads to if mass, no, then test and stay. So I think, um, I don't know if I understand. Do you understand the question, Liza? Yeah, um, um, I think there was just yeah. some new guidance issued by the Department of Public Health and the State Education Department that I think is answering this question, which is if somebody, if there's a student with a disability who, um, if the district is testing consistent with this, the, what is being shorthanded called the test and stay policy so that um, kids don't have to quarantine, what happens if the student who otherwise would be able to stay can't wear a mask or can't wear a mask consistently? Is that some, what the question is? And so um, if I'm getting the question right, what the state has said, I don't wanna read this whole thing, but is um, if, state, if students can't wear masks because of disability or medical or behavioral reasons, and if they're identified as close contacts who can participate in tests and stay, then basically if I understood this guidance correctly that just got issued a few days ago, what it means is then the, the staff have to um, follow some more extensive guidelines for the kinds of precautions that they need to be taking. But if I understood this new guidance correctly, I'm looking at it as I'm speaking, that these students should still be able to participate in test and stay. So if this individual um, who's got this question has more questions, then they can contact our office and we can look into it more in light of this new policy because I don't know much more than what I'm just um, reading in this new policy that got issued two days ago. Okay, I'm putting the helpline information in our chat. That goes for anybody. If you wanna discuss any of these questions more in depth and speak with one of our advocates, you can contact our helpline. And just, just to clarify that the test and stay program does apply specifically to close contacts of you know someone who has tested positive. Uh, that's the whole purpose of the programs. So I wasn't sure it, reading the question exactly. Um, you know at, at what stage your question came in, but if a student with a disability did come in close 
contact with, with someone who has tested positive for COVID, they should be eligible for the test and stay um, option as opposed to quarantining. And then, you know, and then there's the component about whether they're able to wear a mask, which Julia addressed. Great. Um, this person's I wondering. Like on Rumber, do they still have those like college bowl shows? I'm older than anybody else here right now where they keep asking hard questions and the question is, can you answer them all? These are really good questions, but I'm not sure how well we're going to do, but we're doing our best. <laughs> so keep going. Like rapid fire today. Um, this person's wondering if you have any knowledge of what's happening in the legislature for graduating students for this coming year, 2022. Um, I had a bill filed giving an extended year if they were negatively impacted. I went to the head of the Education Review Board, was told they were reviewing, but this needs to be done in a fast pace. I filed a complaint with the Compliance Department and I'm awaiting their decision. Um, we had a news story done and I testified at the City Council, just wondering if anybody has any more updates that I'm not aware of. Yeah, we get there's a there's a lot of bills that have been filed, and that's a really important one. Um, that I mean, there is more than one bill, but the bill that I'm familiar with would allow students who would be graduating, whether um, during the pandemic, to have an additional year, both students with disabilities and students without disabilities. The legislative process, as this person um, noted in their question, is a long and lengthy process, and there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of bills filed and very few of them, um, many of the most compelling ones don't always make it through to the finish line. So um, we real, I'm sure the there's members in the legislature who understand the urgency. I think most people here tonight understand the urgency of that particular piece of legislation. The um, education committee is the first place that that bill has to be voted on. And my understanding is the Joint Education Committee has not yet voted on this bill. I believe they have a deadline sometime early next year that they have to vote one way or the other about that bill. And then after that vote, there are many, many other votes that have to take place both in the House and Senate if it does get voted out favorably. So um, I think the important thing is for that legislation and other pieces of, of legislation that parents and advocates are concerned about, the most important thing is to do what this um, person who asked the question is doing is to contact your own state senator and your own state rep. And Joanne, maybe you can drop the link into how people can find out who their state senator and state rep is um, to, to voice your support. Because the more they hear from constituents, the more um, attention uh, worthy bills like the one this person was talking about, um, you know, the more likely that the legislature will give it the, the attention that's required. Liza, do you have anything to add to that? No. There it also related to students who exit, there is also legislation that's been filed to try to get additional funding for the compensate, and maybe that's what the person meant by complaint. There, you know, there's a lot of people who believe that there should just be an automatic additional year for students who lost so much because of the pandemic. And then there's also a legal ride through compensatory services for additional services, even if somebody's already turned 22 or you know otherwise. Um, but there's also a bill trying to get more funding for those older students who've been impacted by the pandemic. Joanne, do you have anything to add about that? Those bills? Um, no, just the same thing, because I've, I've talked to a couple of parents this week about, or a parent, a couple of times this week, about the same thing about a bill, how 601 is the one that she was referring to. I'm not sure which bill number that is, but absolutely reach out to your rep and senator and, and get, get your friends and family to do that as well. Yeah, I'll also put a link in the chat to sign up for our advocacy email list, um, so you can stay up to date on Max legislative priorities including that one. Um, our next question is, if the school says they do not have enough community partners for a high school student's vocational program, can parents suggest ESSER 3 funds for the school to contract more vendors? Um, that's a good question. The, the ESSER funds are the um, education funds that are flowing 
out of Congress, you know, to help the stimulus funds that are to help address the impact. And there's lots of lots of money flowing into every state, but there's some money that's targeted specifically to schools. And every school district is getting um, a significant amount of money out of several different laws that were passed by Congress. So actually the Federal Department of Education just issued uh, some very lengthy guidance and we can include that in the follow-up materials that we send next week after this chat. For those of you who are new to the chat, we normally have some presentation at the beginning and then a, Q, a shorter Q&A, you know, where we go into things in more detail and those are recorded if people want more background about some of these issues. But, but in any event, the new, the new federal guidance really underscored the importance of addressing the needs of transition age youth who required uh, under federal law transition services, which are many cases are community-based as this questioner noted. They might be um, supported job sites, they might be travel training, they might be learning to navigate the community in the community or participating on college campuses. And all those, many of those things have were um, not possible and in, in many cases continue to be very limited because of uh, what's been happening in the pandemic this fall. So regardless of where the funding comes from, students still have a right to have all the transition services that they need to have their IEP fully implemented. If they can't, the district has the obligation to provide the compensatory services, which as we said, could go beyond age 22 if that's what's necessary to make up for the inability to provide all those kinds of community-based transition services. And, and, the, and what we've seen some parent groups and parent advisory councils beginning to do is to really advocate the way this person is talking about that their school committee and their superintendent decide to use some of this additional federal funding coming in, the ESSER funding, to particularly target the needs of transition age youth. And we really support parents in your local communities. You know best how students with disabilities were impacted by the pandemic in your community. The school districts have a substantial amount of funding that they can use to address your kids' needs over the next five years. And they're more likely to target those, fund, those funds to the services that are going to most address the needs of the kids in your community if they hear from you. So I think that questioner is spot on. It's completely appropriate to use the federal funds. And even if they don't decide to, they still have to provide the services is what I would say. Liza, do you want to add there? Yeah, I, don't, I definitely don't have anything to add. I think that was really comprehensive, but um, you know, maybe I'll just reiterate kind of what, what you said, which is that the school district must provide individualized transition services to meet your child's vocational transitional needs and not having the options, the vocational options available or not having the funds can't be a reason legally not to provide them if your child needs, needs those services to, you know, to make progress. Um, so oftentimes we'll hear districts say, well, that's not an option because of X, Y, Z logistical barrier or because of funding limitations and legally that, that really can't be a reason. Um, and so th they have to provide the services that are appropriate and individualized to your child to meet your child's needs, regardless of where the funding came from, which, which Julia said. And then I would just say, you know, separately from that, which I think Julia also stated, you can advocate um, regarding the use of ESSER funds, but it, it doesn't, that advocacy doesn't necessarily need to be attached to the advocacy in your individual case for the transition services that your child needs. For those of you who are um, active in your, in your, the parent, the PACs, the special needs PACs or the CPACs as some are called in your community, we just saw one community that's having uh, a PAC meeting that's totally devoted to having the parents discuss together what are the priorities for how they think the additional federal funds should be used so that the PAC can help to lead, um, you know, to contribute to the school committee's decision. So if that you think that strategy might be useful in your community, we could send you the flyer that, um, you know, one of these other PACs we saw put together. 
Yeah, and our um, Mac Autism Connections Facebook group is another good place to share um, that kind of information. I just put a link to that in the chat. Our next question is, if a child has home ABA on their IEP and the school district determines that the child is better serviced in a private setting and he starts the private school, but they don't offer home ABA, can we still get that service through the school he left? You want to go, Liza? Look, you're shaking your head. Um, I mean, if I'm understanding the question correctly, if home ABA is on the IEP, um, which was written by the school district, but the student is in, it sounds like maybe in an out of district private placement, and that, that private placement doesn't provide home ABA, my understanding is if it's on the IEP, the school district is still responsible for, you know, finding a way to, to provide it, you know, having a conversation with the private placement. Um, it may be a conversation that needs to be had by the IEP team to determine how that service is going to be provided. But if it's clearly stated on the IEP, then the school district is responsible for ultimately making sure that it is provided somehow. Um, was that your interpretation of the question, Julia? Yeah, again, I wasn't quite sure, but if this was the district decided that the child needed an out of district, private, you know, special ed, private school placement, then absolutely, well, you know, you said, Liza, is true that, and that, you know, we do see that not just with ABA, but sometimes when a child is placed in an out of district placement, there's certain um, related services or other services that that private school doesn't have the capacity to provide, or sometimes the child needs an additional aid or one-to-one -one aid that the school doesn't automatically have. So as Liza said, it's, the school district still legally obligated to make sure that happens. Sometimes the district um, has to, you know, address that in their contract with the school, or they may, you know, it's, up, it's it. They, the private school and the school district, have to figure out together how to make sure that happens. I think the question was asking whether or not the child could get the ABA from the same service provider that they were before, and I'm not sure they would have an automatic right to the same service provider from the previous school, but you definitely have a right to have the IEP implemented. Joanne, have something to add? If you don't mind, <laughs> yeah. No, and, and it, you know, if it's if it's not written in this IEP and it was written in the previous, they can reject in part and then go back to the the last agreed upon IEP and get those services, and the school would be responsible as well. So, just, point. Uh, really good point. Great questions coming in, and we had a request to send that flyer to PAC. So I see your request there. We'll get that out to you. Um. If my child's SLP therapist quit in December 2020 and the school didn't hire someone for three months, would the compensatory be COVID related? Are there different rules for COVID compensatory versus compensatory services? Great question. Um, they're really, they're, the, they're not necessarily different rules. Compensatory services are required whenever an IEP isn't um, fully implemented and then the child's unable to make effective progress or regresses because of that. And so though it should still um, be an individualized determination, there is no reason that you can't use the same IEP process where you're discussing um, COVID compensatory services, you know, which although who knows why that speech therapist was not there, maybe that was related to COVID as well. But it, it, the standards are the same in terms of looking at whether the IEP was implemented and then looking at the impact on the child and looking at what types of um, compens services are gonna compensate for the failure to implement the IEP and how do you make the child whole. Um, if the district, the district could, you wouldn't necessarily, and whether you call them COVID compensatory services or just compensatory services, shouldn't have any legal it shouldn't make a difference legally, as far as I understand. I, I think normally compensatory services were something that very few parents ever dealt with before COVID. And I think the reason that um, the federal department of ed and the state department of ed have begun to label something as COVID compensatory services is because it's become a remedy that many, many 
children have to have the IP team meet about to figure out whether or not they need the services. So I think they were trying to make it clear that this is not such a rare thing anymore because of the pandemic. Liza, do you wanna add in there? No, I think, I think that covers it. It sounds like the child would be entitled to compensatory services in this instance. And for that child, maybe, you know, if that was the only reason they needed compensatory services, if they didn't have anything related to um, the remote instruction or delays in testing because of COVID, then they might only need the compensatory because of the speech therapist not being there. But if the child needed compensatory, needed compensatory both because of the speech therapist's absence, as well as something that's more directly COVID related, then they'd have the right to both. Um, so there's a follow up from this same person. They said, I have a signed compensatory offer stating it will be delivered outside of the school day and to be delivered by end of this school year because of the SLP who quit and the three months missed. But the school is actually currently providing in school mostly group compensatory without notifying me until I asked. The special ed director responded that it was now in school and if I'm okay with that. I'm not okay with that. What can I do now? I am trying going to have to try to read that because I couldn't follow. <laughs> Why did you follow? I'm sorry. It was just detailed. It's um, yeah. I mean, it sounds like there was an agreement for the compensatory services to be provided outside of the school day, outside of the school building, something along those lines. And now that arrangement has changed without the parents' permission. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the question that I have is whether there's anything in writing about the way in which the compensatory services were going to be provided. Like if there was, I don't know if there was a compensatory services agreement. Sometimes there are, you know, like settlement agreements, compensatory services agreements that are drafted to um, summarize the terms of the compensatory services. Of, so if there's anything in writing either through an agreement or if it's even written into the IEP and it states um, the way in which services were going to be provided and the school district has now made a change to that. I think that yeah. you, you it could have an argument. It was, all that, in, it was all in writing. So the signed offer it was in writing outside of the school day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, it's hard without actually reading the language, um, to, to totally weigh in, but I would say that if it's clear in writing about you know, that services needed to be provided in a certain context or a certain time of day for some reason, you know, then you could just point back to that original um, agreement or that original writing um, and, and raise that to the district's attention and say that you're not in agreement with the, with the change in the way the services are, are being provided. Um, and it may just be that the district thought it wouldn't be a big deal. And it turns out that, like you said, you're, you're not in agreement. So it may be that it just a simple conversation could resolve it. Um, but I think either way that the fact that you have it in writing should be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the state has been really clear that when the, if a child needs compensatory services, when whatever the determination is, whether it's by the IEP team or um, some other process, it, the parent needs to get written notification of what uh, what the agreement is. So there should always be something in, in writing, but as Liza said, some school districts have written it up in a much more formal, uh, like a legal agreement way. And some districts are just adding it into the um, notice that comes with the copy of the IEP that they're, the, some of it looks a lot more legal beagle than others, but in, in whatever's in writing should be binding. In addition, the recent guidance from the Federal Department of Education um, underscored that when looking at how to deliver compensatory services, it's really important for school districts to deliver them in a way that doesn't um, diminish a child's ability to be included with non-disabled peers as much as possible, to be in extracurricular act activities and non-academic activities. A lot of families have said to us, my child needs compensatory services, but I don't want them to be losing other kinds of instructional and social, important social um, interactions in order to get the compensatory services. So I think it's just helpful to know that the feds have noticed noted that as well. It has to be what's going to help make the child whole and you shouldn't have to um, 
lose something that the child needs in order to get the compensatory services because you know yeah, that may definitely. not be in the kid's interest. Mm -hmm. So we've got five more minutes, Lilia. Yeah, we have um, a couple more questions. So follow up on that. How can districts be accountable for spending allocated funding to the best interest of children with disabilities? That's a good question. Great question. <laughs> um, if anybody could really figure out, uh, um, this would be a great question to have other people jump in, jump in with your thoughts. Uh, I think in, just my years of experience about how, how what's the best way to keep, to, to ensure that account of, a kind of accountability before a pandemic. And I think the same thing would be true during the pandemic. I think it, it's for your individual child to do the kinds of things that everybody's talking about here, to be very on top of the way we can know the parents and advocates are that we're hearing from in terms of documenting what your child needs and really exercising all your individual rights. But in terms of the funding questions bigger than that, what I think our office has seen to be most effective is when parents mobilize as a group um, and get involved, their school committee members, involve their state legislators, involve their city council or their board of selectmen and their mayor's office, the power of a relatively small group of parents who have the time and energy and who has the time and energy right now, but to mobilize both in terms of funding decisions and then monitoring whether or not um, the money is being spent in a way that's really having the desired outcomes, it, it can have a tremendous impact. And also partnering with other organizations beyond your CPAC, other community organizations, um, and, you know, local, med, um, public health offices and clinics who also have an interest in kids with disabilities, their voices could have a big impact in terms of local accountability for making sure that funds are used in the way that the parents and students really have so much expertise about what's gonna have the best impact. And I think that's such a great question now because it's the community members in different communities have been impacted differently by the pandemic. We know that Black and Latinx and other communities have been very disproportionately impacted. And those community members are gonna really have the knowledge to know what's gonna best begin to make their community whole and their kids whole. Slides, other thoughts? No, I was gonna say the, I was gonna say the same thing. I think that was a good comprehensive response. Really yeah. good question. Um, and I also put a link to our, our um, pivotal moment report in the chat, which can kind of help with answering that. I think it provides our recommendations for prioritizing um, needs of students in this COVID recovery period. Uh, Cause we do have an opportunity now with new funds to fund those that's recommendations. A, that, that's a great point. And I would encourage people to at least look at the executive summary in the report. It's a lengthy report, but it's a shorter executive summary. Because what Mac was able to do was to pull together experts um, who were are very knowledgeable about students with disabilities, and students who are English learners, and students who have are impacted by mental health and behavioral health issues and trauma. And those experts met over three months um, and developed a set of recommendations for what should be happening in the schools. And our hope is that their recommendations will help community organizations, disability organizations, policymakers really make the kind of um, decisions that will have the desired impact to on kids that's gonna be so necessary. The recovery is gonna be a long process. I know everybody here understands that. And we have this amazing opportunity with this huge infusion of both federal and state funds and without accountability, it's very scary to think of um, the lack of impact that that funding could have if we don't have the kind of accountability that person was asking about. Um, and we're nearing the end here, but um, our next question is, if my child receives SLP services on his IEP, but has communicated to me that he does not want to receive them anymore because they're redundant for the past three years and continuing to participate, 
results in a need for behavioral interventions because the supports don't reflect his needs. Is the district accountable to change the way the SLP is delivered? It's another really good question. If, um, you know, the federal law is really clear if the, the IP team should meet, if the child, if the student isn't making the kind of progress that's anticipated with the services that are in the IEP. So if the child, student's progress indicates that there's not the kind of progress that would have been anticipated by the speech therapy because of um, what this person seems to be saying, indicating it is it's not, uh, the, the particular kind of speech therapy that's being delivered doesn't meet that student's individual needs, then the IEP team should proactively be meeting, but the family member and the student, if they're, you know, the student may be at the age, I don't know how old the student is, but there's either the student or the parent can also ask for an IEP meeting and raise exactly that point about how the speech therapy is not meeting that student's needs. And if the IEP team doesn't agree, then they're, you could get an outside evaluation by another speech therapist to see if they can recommend how to better meet the speech and language and communication needs of the student. I'm not sure that answered it, Liza. Do you have anything to add there? No, I think I I think that pretty much covered it. Um, I was just going to say, you know, looking at the the goals, the objectives from from year to year bringing that to the attention of the team, looking at the progress reports carefully. And if there hasn't been enough progress, raising that in IEP team meeting, getting an independent evaluation potentially. And the only other thing was, I wasn't sure if the person, I might've misheard. I wasn't sure if the person said that the student, him or herself, didn't wanna to continue to receive the services. Correct. Um, and with that, I just had a question of how old the student was because um, that might impact just in terms of decision-making. Um, if a student was at the age of majority, then you would get into some legal decision-making questions. Um, 14. What's that? He's 14. 14, okay. So not a, a legal decision-maker yet, but he's a transition age student who should be kind of, whose voice should be included in the process and he should be invited to IEP team meetings to participate or she. Um, and so I would just, you know, really make sure that that's happening and that the school is listening not only to you, but also to your to your child and to their input. That's a really good point. And um, in the same way that you can have the parent um, uh, concerns at the beginning, there's a real need for the IP team to um, write down and address what the student's concerns are. So the parent could support the student to, in writing or verbally to say that you know, that would have a lot of weight in, in terms of the IP team to hear from the parent, the student directly, whenever, whatever way the student's comfortable. Um, as we're, I know Joanne just uh, put up the, the poll questions and we're gonna be ending soon. We would, we continue to figure out what the best way is to support you all through this extended pandemic and recovery period. Let us know if this kind of just open Q&A worked or didn't work or ways you thought that we could better improve it. Let us know if there's topics or speakers that you think would be helpful in the coming months. And um, thank you very much for your continued interest, um, relentless advocacy on support of the kids and the kids you work with and everything they're doing to address the needs of students with disabilities through this. Uh, continually difficult time. It's great yeah. to see all of you. Um, I also just wanna get in that the open enrollment period for the autism waiver begins tomorrow. So Julia, I don't know if you wanted to say something about that, I'll put a link chat. Yeah, for any families who have uh, children with autism who are younger than nine years old, there is a very simple, um, who are eligible for mass health, there's a very simple uh, application to fill out to be eligible for the Children's Autism Medicaid Waiver, which provides um, choices for the family to determine what kinds of in-home services or supports in the community can support their child, whether it's ABA or floor time or other types of services. Um, so it's there's a lot more students who want the services than there are slots. So it's really important to get the application in 
in this next 10 days. I believe it's 10 days, is that right, Joanne? And then um, if there's, as their opening is available, then the family member can choose whether or not um, they wanna go ahead with, with obtaining the waiver services. But it's a very parent-driven process in terms of determining what kinds of supports will help your child um, stay in their home successfully and in their community. So, so it's the, until the end of the month that it's available that you can sign up, so. Starting okay. tomorrow. Yeah. Starting tomorrow, yes. And we, do we put that in the, yep, that's in the link as well. Yeah. I was just going to just add that if we didn't get to your questions or weren't able to answer your questions fully, then you can call our helpline and Lilia has put that link in the, um, uh, the phone number or the link in a few times already, I believe. So thank you. For doing yeah. That. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll be sending a follow up email to um, all the registrants with resources from tonight's chat. You'll also be directed to a link to a survey when you close out. Um, if you filled that out already, thank you. We don't need you to fill it out again. If not, that's another opportunity to provide your feedback. We really wanna um, make sure we're doing this in the best way to meet all your needs. So let us know what's most helpful for you. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. Liza, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks for you. Yeah. No, I just wanted to thank everyone. Thanks for all your good work and, and best of luck, uh, you know, in the coming months as you continue to advocate for your kids uh, and your clients. Really appreciate all the work you're doing. Right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.